Yesterday, you might have heard as part of my favourite teacher project uh, about a, a grade six classroom where the teacher got the kids to build a mini society from the ground up, piece by piece. It had an economy, it had elections, all the trappings and complexities, in fact, of a, a genuine society. A, a fascinating education experiment. It had left an impression on Victorian Greens MP, Alan Sandal, when she experienced that whole experiment when she was 11 and we met that very teacher. Well, my next guest wants us to consider what would happen if we asked a classroom of kids to build a bank from the ground up. Could a group of kid bankers be key to helping corporate leaders better understand their ethical and social responsibilities, perhaps? I mean, think of the recent Volkswagen emissions scandal, the absolutely shocking dam disaster in Brazil in a BHP bulletin mine that has left thousands of livelihoods in peril. Have you seen the footage of that situation? It is horrendous. Guiding businesses and governments and individuals down pathways of clear ethical purpose has become a quest of a uh, former engineer turned business consultant, Karen James. A big part of achieving this, she argues, is for people to become the leader in their own lives. She's certainly done that, as we'll hear. She's speaking at this week's Fearless Women's Business event. Uh, she also founded the Commonwealth Bank's Women in Focus Network. That's a, a network, I think, that involves some 10,000 businesswomen. And she's the author of a new book, On Purpose, Why Great Leaders Start with the Plot. And plot is at the heart of this. Hi. Welcome. Hi. How are you? Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So there's this fictional scenario of a grade three classroom and a fabulous teacher, Ms Malloy, who's actually based on a real life teacher in your life, I think. Um, and she wants to turn a class of kids into a bunch of bankers. <laughs> Why did you want to explore this little experiment, this fable? Well, I think that uh, we learn the most through stories and we learn the most when we see it coming through the eyes of, of children. And year three was one of my favorite years and kind of honed in on it because that's kind of the point of, of, of change in a child's life where the innocence can be lost. Um, and so with Miss Malloy, who is a dear friend of mine, I, I did a lot of research and decided to throw at the kids the idea of building a bank based on humanity, based on justice, based on ethics, and uh, see what they came up with. Humanity, justice, ethics. The cynics amongst us will say banks have nothing to do with any of that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I spent eight years working in a bank and believe there is a heart in every bank. It, it's, uh, it's there, it just needs to be you know, brought to life through community and through its customers. And at the heart of On Purpose is the notion that there are many constituents. There's, there's stakeholders such as share, shareholders, but the most important one is the customer. And when you consider the customer and your purpose, it truly comes to life. And that's what the, the kids in Miss Malloy's class uncover. And uh, the beauty for me of the fable is that the, the real protagonist, which I always thought was going to be one of the kids, through writing the story, ended up becoming you know, the quintessential Bob the banker. Father which, of one of the kids. Father of Bobby. <laughs> yeah. And the kid, you know, Bobby, um, the little kid, comes into the classroom thinking he's going to have all the answers and he's going to build the big bubblegum bank and it's all going to be just right because he knows exactly how to run a bank because his father's a banker. Not the case. Not the case at all. And it ends up that um, what Bobby learns is that often, you know, things are happening within organizations that are just mechanical. People are, are going to work, they're ticking boxes, they're not sure why, they're spending time in meetings that have no purpose, they're working on projects that get misguided. And, you know, they start to drift and they start to lose their direction. And then the, the shift that happened with Bob is that he started to have two lives, one at home and one at work. And through his relationship with his son and going through the exercise with Miss Malloy, it became very apparent to him that those must be connected to truly have a connected life and that you must have a connection between your head and your heart, both at home and at work, if you are truly going to bring your humanity wherever you go. This disconnect between our sense of personal purpose and our sense of purpose at work is profound for you. This is at the heart of what you're trying to explore in this book, isn't it? And this, this acronym, and yes, who needs more acronyms, but you've thought carefully about this one, this acronym of PLOT. Yes. 
I think that um, I've spent 30 years in two distinct industries, banking and finance and IT, spent a lot of my career in crisis management. So as part of my research, I did a, a deep reflection on, you know, my experiences and where success exists and where it didn't. And the, and the common denominator was a shared purpose and a purpose that had meaning that people could connect with. But was, what was also really obvious was the, the need for leadership, strong leadership, not just values stuck on a wall, but leadership that was standing on a rock of, of strong ethics, leadership that was deep in character and leadership that could lead with the values of the organization. And I also saw that those two things can often go wrong. And it, it, that was obvious because it never propagated through the organization. So operationally, things just didn't make it to everybody for whatever reason, you know, whether it's middle management or just, just communication tools or lack thereof, performance indicators, things, you know, the way people are getting paid. And then yeah, I couldn't get past technology. You know, I'm an engineer and technology powers everything in our world. And if your technology is not being powered with your purpose, we're well, probably building it for the wrong reason. And you see that with a lot of technology builds, you end up with something that you can't understand how you got because mm. you lost your way in the project. And that last 10%, the bit that makes that difference, it gets technology on purpose is lost. And you know, we just have to look at what the way some of the technology we have is being used in the wrong way or off purpose in the world to fuel wars, to fuel greed, to fuel bad behaviors. So plot represents the importance of weaving purpose, leadership, embedding it in your operations and then powering it through your technology. And this is personal for you, isn't it? Because as you mentioned, you were an engineer. Uh, that was your first career. Why? Well, for me, becoming an engineer was was a decision based on my personal decision to become the leader of my life. I didn't know that phrase at the time. I just knew at the age of 15 or 16 that I needed to have a different life than the one my mom had. I needed to be able to look after my mom. I needed to kind of break th through the the working class background that I was trapped in, in, in what I would probably, I think now would be called a, an environment of domestic violence. And I saw education as that ticket and my mom made that very clear to me that this is your one go and to make it a good one. And so I asked if I could be put in calculus in year 12. And uh, I grew up in a town called Bergenfield, New Jersey. And there, you know, there were only about 12 kids in that class and, and I didn't have the, the trigonometry grade to get in. And I mm. approached the teacher and he said, it's going to be tough. I said, well, uh, uh, put me in it. Just give me a go. You can drop me out if, if I don't make it. And then I worked hard and, mm. um, and it wasn't easy because these were the brains of the school, you know, 12 out of 400. And, um, you know, I got a C, <laughs> which is average, <laughs> but it, it was enough. So irrelevant now, though. <laughs> so irrelevant. <laughs> I still think about it. <laughs> See, we do, don't we? <laughs> Us perfectionists. <laughs> but, I mean, that, that response at that age was, you didn't really have the language that this was this idea of exploring the leader within, of enabling the leader within in order to live a meaningful life in order to escape what you were living in as a yes. child. But that's what you were doing. That instinct was quite strong, wasn't it? It was instinctive. And um, I was also very blessed to be um, ha to have great aunts. And my first company that um, I launched last year was called KBSN. K for my mother, Kath, B for my grandmother, Beatrice, S for my great aunt, Sissy, and N for my great aunt, Nini. And, and these mm. women over a period of you know, 30, 40 years mentored me, but I didn't know I was being mentored, you know, and, and they didn't know they were mentoring me, I don't think. Particularly my great aunt, Sissy, she has 60, 70 nieces and nephews, and she reached out to me and I write about it in the book. She used to take me into New York City on the bus and, you know, showed me, mm. you know, what opportunity can look like. And we used to have lunch on Fifth Avenue and Lord and Taylor's, and she'd say, this is my niece. She's going to do great things. And you know, I believed her and uh, she was a banker, ironically. And um, she believed that I could be what I wanted to be. And I think that that had a big impact on me. You know, the, I, I believe in, in the sisterhood and I believe in women making a difference for other women. And Not many women in engineering when you landed in there and that presented some fascinating challenges. What, you know, challenges I know about personally too. Yeah, Creative challenges. Yes, yes. <laughs> Talking about inner leadership. <laughs> yeah, I didn't read the memo that there were no women. I arrived thinking there'd be lots of us. <laughs> what did you encounter? 
Oh, well, I got there. And in year one, it's in America at the time, it's mostly math and physics and everybody's in it together. Year two, you hit the hardcore engineering classes. And uh, in my first electrical engineering class, I'll never forget it. It was our first lab and all the guys formed a circle. And Professor Sylvester with his salt and pepper hair and beard said, what are you going to do, Karen? And I looked at him. So they were actually blocking your entry? Blocking my entry. It was a joke. I don't know. Possibly not. Yeah, pub- possibly not. They were in the class when I asked publicly what a piston was, and they couldn't believe I didn't know that. So they bet knew you, it. I bet you there was a guy in that classroom that didn't know either, <laughs> but they never admit it. It's exactly what I said. Yeah. So Professor Sylvester said, Karen, this is the metaphor for the rest of your life. What are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to get in the circle. He said, all right. And I went to get in. They wouldn't let me in. So I crawled between their legs. I popped up in the center. I said, I'm in this lab group. That's it. (laughs) It was a profound moment. I'll never forget it because it was a moment of truth. You know, you have them. And I just thought, this is what's, this is what I've got to do. So you worked as an engineer for many years, but then you went into the business world and had some incredible success there building big million dollar businesses, I think. Yes. I, I transitioned the type of engineer I was, I was initially in the lab, but I'm an extrovert, didn't work for me, went into systems engineering, which puts you in a lot of travel, a lot of late nights, a lot of weekends. I wanted to have children and decided to get into IT services. So I um, I ran services from that point on. And um, I did that in two different com- countries and grew one business from 9 million to 100 million based on a really simple purpose, you know, to consistently and reliably deliver excellent service, which doesn't sound very riveting, but at the time it was the start of the industry where people were making decisions about, you know, how to allocate engineers, how to allocate spares on risk rather than calculated service levels. And so we made a decision that we would build on calculated service levels, which means if you bought two hours, you were going to have a part in your city. And a lot of companies didn't. And you saw most of those companies fall away during the dot-com boom because they just weren't delivering the service to the expectation. Karen James is with us this morning. She's the author of On Purpose, Why Great Leaders Start With The Plot. And so back to purpose then, because for many businesses, they will say, well, we've got a mission statement and we've developed a set of corporate values. Is that not a clear purpose? I don't believe so. And I I write about this because I think in my experience, people always say, I don't understand the difference between our mission and our vision. I would have heard that a hundred times in my career. And mission is is not the language people use in their day-to-day lives. It's it's not a verb, it's a noun. It's it's often associated with military action. And I, I prefer the word purpose. It's a verb, it's a noun, people connect with it. It defines your reason to exist. If you need a mission, keep a mission. You can have a mission for a particular moment in time, but I think people really connect with it and purpose can have strong meaning. And from that purpose, you can then weave to a long-term vision and attach a strategy. And then your values are what's important to you at that time. So for example, you know, innovation is a value most companies have now because it's so critical, but it's it's different from the character and the ethics. Those so Those are things that are in the ethos of, of the organization and, and those need to be stated. But your interest in all this is building businesses that are ethical at their heart and ethical in their actions. And when you look at companies like Volkswagen, the emission scandal, where the car company knowingly circumvented US emissions regulations, BHP Billiton, which co-owns the mining company responsible for the deadly dam burst last month in Brazil, shocking images coming out of that. You think that purpose going wrong is at the core of both of those events. How? I I do. I do. I think that if you look at Volkswagen in particular and you get on their website, they're they're missing a key constituent. You know, they, they, they don't stress the importance of the environment. And, you know, the environment is as important as their employees in terms of their business model. And if their purpose clearly stated if their reason to exist was also to protect the environment, to do the best job they can do. And that was somehow infused into their purpose statement. I think there there would not have been that type of error in an organisation. Really, though, many big corporations have uh, that triple bottom line Mm. set up, established. They say that sustainability is vital, that environmental protection is vital. 
all lip service, little mm. action. Mm. And I think that relates to the, the operational side of things. You know, if you're paying people on that, it's going to happen. If you're measuring performance on that, it's going to happen. If you've got the right policies and procedures so that whistleblowers can go to the most senior people, including the chairman, it's going to happen. I mean, you look at Takata with the airbag debacle in America and worldwide. You know, there were engineers that knew about that. If that company had a, a whistleblower policy in place and process, maybe... Just remind people what the airbag debacle was. This was um, when 53 million airbags have to be recalled mm. worldwide because there were errors in manufacturing and in storage that turned the airbag from an airbag into effectively a, a grenade and, you know, moved through the press very quickly, the media very quickly, biggest recall in the history of the planet. And, um, and you know, how does a company whose purpose is clearly safety miss that? And, and that's that operational piece. So sometimes, you know, it's our operations, you know, the, you know, bad operations can trump the best purpose and the best leaders. So you've got to have that embedded. And I think that's, that's really my message. You can, you know, you can have intentions, but you've got to have them in actions. And, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not on the inside of Volkswagen and hopefully they'll be able to disclose where that went wrong. But I would hope that if a, they had a stronger purpose to represent the environment and they operationally built that in, that, you know, that would never happen again. Well, their purpose ultimately is to sell more cars, it could be argued. Yes, well, <laughs> which goes back to the, you know, one visceral And depending number. on the fuel, that depends then on what <laughs> impact they have on the environment. <laughs> exactly. And I think my position is we've got to move past one number. Just briefly and finally, what, what's the Fearless Women Conference all about that you're speaking at this week? Oh, it's uh, it's the annual big conference for she business and uh, kicks off with 300 women at Luna Park and uh, hmm. Susie Jacobs is the founder. I've known her for over five years and um, it's all about uh, setting the stage for next year, launching yourself into 2016 with uh, the attitude of being fearless. So I'm really looking forward to it. Women who are fearless on many fronts, including the business world. Absolutely, on all fronts. Karen, uh, James, thanks so much for joining us in the Life Matters studio today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great to hear your story. What a story it is. Karen James, she is the CEO of the On Purpose Hub, author, engineer, consultant, many hats, uh, and mum as well. Mm -hmm. And the book is On Purpose, Why Great Leaders Start With The Plot, published by Wiley. Some flashback fashion next on Life Matters.